morning. Thank you for being here today for my session on frontal lobe function, damage, and management. My name is Courtney Sand, and I'm a licensed and board certified behavior analyst and a neuro resource facilitator with the Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa. As a result of attending this webinar, attendees will become familiar with the structure and function of the frontal lobe, how a frontal lobe injury can affect daily functioning across a variety of domains, and how to navigate and manage the impact of a frontal lobe injury using concrete impact-based strategies. Do you know who this man is? Any guesses? That was Phineas Gage, one of the first and most famous studies about the impact of severe damage to the frontal lobe was that of Phineas. In 1948, Gage was a railroad worker who was putting dynamite into rocks while working with the team to lay tracks. As he used a six foot bar to pound the dynamite powder into the rocks, it ignited, essentially making the long steel pole a bullet that fired up through his left eye, through his skull, and landed him about 50 feet away. Gage miraculously survived and was even conscious while he rode on an ox cart to the nearest town for help. As a result of the incident though, Gage's behavior seemed to change as he went from being a rather mild-mannered man to no longer Gage, as his friends would say. The doctor who treated Gage made observations about the change in his behavior that has made Gage one of the first and most famous cases that links brain damage to personality change. This is a very simplistic illustration of some of the parts of the brain, namely its four lobes, the occipital, parietal, frontal, and temporal lobes. The parts of our brain are very much interconnected with one another. And the impact of a brain, brain injury is among other variables determined by the area of the brain that was injured. For the purpose of today's presentation, we will be learning about the frontal lobe and its function in our lives. My hope is that you will better understand what injury to this part of the brain commonly looks like with respect to challenging changes in personality and behavior, as well as how to navigate those changes. So just like it sounds, the frontal lobe is located at the front of the head. The frontal lobe is the largest lobe of the brain and the last lobe to fully develop. The frontal lobe isn't fully developed until a person is in their early to mid twenties. One critical function of the frontal lobe is to regulate impulsive decision-making by being able to engage in effective risk assessment. In other words, the frontal lobe enables a healthy brain, the ability to connect behavior that's occurring in the now with future consequences. It helps us evaluate our options, predict outcomes, and decide the best course of action. The frontal lobe also influences the ability to learn from consequences. Injury to the frontal lobe damages this break. Essentially, it's like speeding with your eyes closed. You can't see where you're going or what might happen to you if you engage in X behavior. This is one of the reasons why we often see a lot of neurobehavioral challenges with a frontal lobe injury. Because its function and what it's responsible for in our lives is so important and widespread, injury to the frontal lobe can be catastrophic. The impact of damage to this part of the brain can manifest in some of the following common ways. A need for more processing time to make sense of information and to generate a response, problems with planning and organizing, difficulty with starting tasks, otherwise known as initiation, and finishing tasks, commonly referred to as behavioral momentum, or seeing a task through to the end. Issues maintaining concentration, being easily distracted, inflexible or rigid thinking, perseveration or brain lock, poor memory, confusion and disorientation, difficulty with judgment and problem, disinhibition, loss of verbal expression, and changes in personality. So now that you know what the frontal lobe's function is, as well as what damage to it can do, let's talk about how to navigate and manage its impact using impact-based strategies. 
Before going over specific frontal lobe impact-based strategies, we're going to quickly review some seemingly review, but critical foundational information about our approach and what that should look like. The approaches and strategies that I'm going to review often work very well with individuals with a frontal lobe injury, as well as injuries to other areas of the brain. But more than that, honestly, most of these strategies are just good practice with people. None of the impact-based strategies that I'm going to go over will be effective if your approach isn't. Remember, you can't change people, but you can modify your approach, the environment, the strategies you implement. Your approach, your mood, your attitude, your body language sets the climate, and it plays a critical role in setting the tone for your interactions with others. Your energy introduces you before you even speak. Be the thermostat and set the emotional temperature in the room versus being the thermometer and reflecting the temperature in the room. Look at behavior through a brain injury-based, trauma-informed lens versus one that is malevolent that assumes the worst in people when we falsely attribute cause to a behavior. For example, saying she never does what I ask her to do versus Remember, she has slow verbal processing, so she can only remember and focus on one verbal direction at a time. Be a behavior investigator. Always seek first to understand the why behind behavior that's challenging. Get into the habit of looking for its purpose, its function. There is a reason for its occurrence. People do what they do for a reason. Behavior represents an individual's best efforts to get their needs met, whether that behavior is socially acceptable, appropriate, or safe. When we look only at behavior, we don't see the person underneath who's often struggling. Behavior, manage behavior management can be frustrating, exhausting, confusing, offensive, embarrassing to manage. But seeking to understand its why may not make it easier, but it can help soften your response to it. You cannot increase or decrease a behavior until you know what it, fe until you know what feeds it. And you cannot feed it until you find out what it eats. What we're referring to here is the function of the behavior or what maintains it. Things like connection seeking, sensory seeking, access to tangibles, desired items, people, experiences. Avoidance or escape of aversive things, people, places. Seeking to understand the why behind challenging behavior also helps us identify the strategies that be, should be put into place to manage it. This helps to take the guesswork and some of the frustration out of behavior management. See people as more than clients, participants, persons served, and patients. There's a person a unique human being behind the brain injury, the diagnoses, the myriad of symptoms, the weaknesses and struggles, a person who deserves to be seen and respected for more than these things. Be intentional about making time to carve out non-contingent or doesn't have to be earned, quality time to focus on establishing rapport and relationship building. Be fully present without distraction, which is so hard to do. And in these moments, listen eagerly to the seemingly little stuff, because in doing so, you're laying the groundwork for addressing the big stuff later on. Consequently, when the survivor you're interacting with is going through a difficult time, they'll be more receptive to your assistance, your redirection, your ideas, behavior management techniques as you have paired yourself with positive associations in the past. It's a seemingly little thing that makes a huge difference. Everyone has a story that is unique and worth hearing. Invite a survivor of brain injury to share their story with you. Share who they were before their injury and who they are now. A natural expected part of hearing a brain injury survivor story is being aware of the devastating, unique kind of grief that is specific to brain injury, a topic that I'm very passionate about, about raising awareness of and educating people on. Ambiguous loss is having but not having. 
there's a death of who a survivor was prior to the brain injury versus who they are now in the aftermath of brain injury. The emotions experienced are similar to that of an actual physical death. Brain injury doesn't live in someone's past. It lives and bleeds into their everyday experience. Give the survivor a voice. Invite their sharing of their likes, dislikes, interests, preferences, and goals. Find out what motivates him or her, what they find reinforcing. Is it verbal praise, public versus private recognition? And then when possible, incorporate these details into their daily life as much as possible. For example, preferring morning showers versus evening showers. And use this person-centered approach, adopting a nothing about me without me approach. And this makes an individual an active and more successful part of their recovery process. If you're a staff member working with a survivor who lives in a community-based residential setting, for example, remember that he or she does not live in your workplace, rather you work in their home. Also remember that his or her room is their home and is likely the only space that they can still call their own. With respect to your approach in general, the teaching of new skills, behavior management, consistency is key. Be as predictable as possible. And then remember that brain injury rehab is a process and it's one that is not linear. It's not something that you get to, it's not a finish line. It's a process that you're moving through. And then celebrate the seemingly, I would say seemingly, seemingly small victories along the way. And then be optimistic, but realistic about this process. So the first set of frontal lobe impact-based strategies that we'll take a look at is that of verbal and expressive communication challenges. On a very basic level, ensure that he or she has a voice, a way to communicate with the world around them, be it verbal communication, gestures, sign language, texting, a communication book, and then ask which method is preferred. And keep in mind that this may change over time and or during situations where he or she finds communication more difficult in times of stress, fear, or anger. Acknowledge communication attempts. And again, a lot of these may seem, um, you know, like, you know, common sense or, duh, of course, I know this, but it truly is this foundational stuff that I always like to come back to and review because when we're dealing with neurobehavioral challenges and the impact of brain injury and trying to navigate all that, everybody involved can get frustrated. And some of these um, core skills sometimes are the first to fall away. So I think it's good to remember, kind of go back to the basics and remember some of these. So my hope again is that you'll, the very least walk away from this presentation with some new tools, and if, and if you're doing everything right and you're doing all these, awesome. But maybe you'll find a tweak with an old tool. You can do something a bit different next time. So with acknowledging communication attempts, for example, you might say something like, hey, I appreciate how hard you're working to explain this to me. I recognize that this is an area that's really difficult for you. Avoid saying use your words. Instead, say something like, I'm sorry, I'm not understanding. I appreciate how hard you're working to communicate with me. Let's work together to figure this out. Can you tell me in a different way? Would it help to write it down instead? And then if verbal or expressive communication is difficult, avoid open-ended questions. Instead, make them yes or no questions. If you're struggling to understand one another, give yourselves permission to push pause and shelf the topic and come back to it later. For example, and I've said this countless times, it's just a very human moment where you're very transparent. You know, we're kind of struggling right now, aren't we? We're really struggling to understand each other. No worries. It happens. What you're saying is really important to me. And I want you to know that. And I want to understand what you're saying. So why don't we take a short break? And then we can try it again in a bit. We'll get this figured out. The next frontal lobe impact section is getting and maintaining attention. Again, a seemingly basic thing that can make a big difference, right? 
use his or her name first before saying something or asking a question to ensure that you have their attention can be a really helpful and grounding way to start a conversation, make a request. Minimize environmental distractions as much as possible. Things like background noise, bright lights, cluttered walls. One speaker at a time. More than that can be really overwhelming. And then that in turn makes it difficult to focus on the content of what's being said. Simplify your words and shorten your sentences. Avoid being overly wordy. Reduce unnecessary verbal noise when you can. Be direct, as black and white as possible. Avoid being vague, leaving things up to possible misinterpretation and subsequent confusion. Define words and provide examples when needed to provide clarification. And be patient. And it's easier said than done, I know. Allow for extra processing time for the survivor to understand what you are saying or asking, and then as well as to generate a response, whether it's a verbal response or a physical response. Proactively check in with him or her throughout the conversation or task to stay ahead of fatigue and distraction, boredom, confusion. Utilize a timer if you need to, to go off at specific intervals during which he or she can do a body check to see if they're on task. And then if not, Coaching can be provided to assist him or her in doing so. So for example, hey, can I point something out to you? In the last five minutes or so, while working on your cognitive rehab worksheet, I've noticed that you've been kind of staring off a bit and drumming your fingers on the table, which I know that that usually means that you're having a hard time or you have something on your mind. Are you needing help? Am I right? If so, how can I help you be successful right now? Taking brain breaks that do not have to be earned in order to use them that can help maintain attention by allowing one's brain to rest and then come back to the conversation or task at hand. Be flexible about allowing these. The next frontal lobe impact section we're going to cover is initiation, task presentation, and time management. As a neural resource facilitator with the Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa, one of the, the most challenging and frustrating changes that I hear so often from a survivor is the changes they experience in their initiation. So I'm hoping here to provide some, some concrete strategies around some of those struggles. Avoid unfairly and mistakenly labeling initiation dysfunction as lazy, unmotivated, has disregard for. A frontal lobe injury, as we talked about a bit ago, often affects the get up and go or the gas pedal in the brain, which we often refer to as initiation. So simply saying something like, you, you, you need to just adjust your attitude and care more about X, or why isn't that done yet? Just do it already. It's like telling someone driving through a hurricane to just turn on their windshield wipers. It's really not that easy for them. A person can want to do something very much, but with a frontal lobe injury, just the ability, I mean, they can have the ability to start that task or activity, have the skills to do so, but actually making it happen, putting it into action can be extremely challenging. Avoid punishing the behavior you want to see. So for example, so you finally decided to get up out of bed, huh? Or thank you for calling to make that appointment with your neurologist. Why can't you do that all the time? As a rule of thumb, avoid words like finally and all when attempting to praise or motivate someone. When someone takes a step in the right direction, encourage and genuinely praise their efforts. Help envision what the end product, what done looks like in detail by making it visible. <clears throat> I ran across this resource the other day and I think it's fantastic. So someone with a healthy brain, someone who is quote neurotypical, can usually imagine what done looks like with respect to a task or activity. And then we can usually work backwards from there to determine the steps that we need to take. But with somebody with a frontal lobe injury or executive dysfunction, they usually have significant challenges in being able to do this. 
Not only that, but also identifying what is needed to get started in terms of supplies and support, as well as how to start. If you can't clearly see what you're working toward, it's overwhelming, paralyzing to try to get started. So what might this look like in terms of strategy? So for a kiddo with a brain injury, what does ready for school look like? Take a picture of him or her with all the things that they need to bring to school, like their backpack, lunchbox, bottled water, mask, snow gear. <clears throat> and then each morning, show him or her that picture and say, okay, match this picture. Even if you have to walk around with them and just, you know, whether you have to do a verbal cue or adjust, adjust your prompt or point to the picture. This done picture can help him or her see the wholeness of what he or she looks like in the future when the task is complete. Because they're not able to generally generate that intrinsically sort of on their own. So you're helping them do that with this sort of external visible tool. I just think that's fantastic. And I think honestly, it can be used brain injury or not. Um, it can be used with individuals with anxiety. For example, somebody who maybe after brain injury, they don't have the kind of um, confidence or social competence that they used to have. We hear that a lot. And, you know, what is it going to look like? What is, <clears throat> what is this, uh, you know, birthday party going to look like? If they can't picture it sort of in their mind's eye. You might go through pictures of what to expect at a party. It's a crowd of people. I know you get, you know, visually overstimulated. There might, here's a picture. There's sometimes there's a lot of balloons, a lot of colors, a lot of noise. Here's a picture of some noise makers. So really help painting a picture, whatever that looks like, I think can be really helpful for people. So I think this is a, a really cool strategy. And then I included here the, it's the get ready, do done model. And there's the website there for more information. Delivery. Delivery is key. It's what you say and how you say it. My mom used to tell me all the time, you can say the same thing in two very different ways. Speak from a place of dignity and respect versus authority, which can be really hard for, for um, staff, you know, working with somebody with a, with a brain injury. When possible, phrase directives or, you know, requests or tasks to do things as an invitation versus a demand. Again, here's the, you know, saying the same thing, but just two very different ways. So instead of saying, for example, <clears throat> it's eight o'clock, time to wake up. Do you want to get up and help me make breakfast? Yeah, no. You know, the door is slammed in your face. I'm going to roll over in bed. I'm going back to sleep. No. Do I want to wake up? No, I don't. Versus, hey, got some bacon and eggs in the refrigerator. I love your company. You make a mean pancake. Come on on and join me. So it's saying the same thing in a different way, right? It's one is more open-ended. It sounds more like an invitation where the other one sounds like I don't really have a choice. Provide empowering choice-making opportunities when possible. A soul-crushing level of independence is lost following a brain injury. As such, give a survivor as much control as, as you can over the decisions in their life. For example, instead of saying, no, you can't push your shower off until tomorrow. <clears throat> you need to shower today. That's your goal. You know that. Versus, I hear you. Listen, when I'm worn out, sometimes I don't feel like showering either. It's kind of the last thing I want to do. How about this? Do you prefer to shower after you eat breakfast here in a bit or tonight after dinner? Your choice. Which do you want? Avoid scheduling tasks during times of day when fatigue is more likely to be a factor. Account for fatigue and stimulus overload by proactively scheduling in those brain breaks throughout the day and during long or difficult tasks. To set him or her up for success, establish a way of ensuring that all functionally related items necessary are together in completing the task are gathered up prior to starting it. So for example, before starting the process of doing their morning routine with them in the bathroom he or she is prompted to grab the caddy labeled morning routine that already has all the supplies that are needed in it. Shampoo, conditioner, body wash, that kind of thing. So setting somebody up for success, however that looks. Visually numbering the steps in a task and awarding them in a sequential fashion, like first, then, next, 
lastly, can be helpful. Incorporate first blank, then blank language when possible, as it increases motivation and establishes the contingency or relationship, <clears throat> communicating that reinforcement is available after engaging in a lesser preferred activity. So for example, first, let's get you in the shower. Then we can fix up some dinner to eat while you watch TV. How does that sound? Avoid double barreling directives. For example, instead of saying, I need you to print out this um, brain injury waiver application, fill it out, you know, email it to DHS, Instead, break it down the, the, the task by chunking it into individual steps, similar to that of a recipe. For example, first, you'll need to print off this application. When you've got this step done, we'll move on to the next one and so on. This approach helps to make larger tasks feel more manageable and less overwhelming. Utilize a visual and or audible timer to communicate <clears throat> Sorry, the passage of time. I have a picture there. <coughs> we have one in our house. These are fantastic. Modify task presentation. Like, uh, and that might look like easy, easy, hard to boost confidence and create behavior momentum. For example, you know, first we'll work on your addition math flashcards, and then we'll do your subtraction cards because those are review. When we finish those, we'll work on just a few of those multiplication problems together. Again, you're you're trying to sort of hit the gas pedal, help them with initiation, getting things going, boosting confidence by doing something that they enjoy, that they're good at, et cetera. And then you introduce <clears throat> something that's difficult or boring um, or, or new that might be um, anxiety provoking, for example. And be flexible, allow for flexibility to reschedule a task for a later time when he or she has more energy or motivation. Presume competence. Even if someone doesn't understand your speech, they will feel and understand your belief in them. Assume the best in people. And then re remember skill versus will <clears throat> and can't versus won't. There's a huge difference between someone choosing not to do something and he or she not currently having the skills and confidence to successfully do so. They might even have the skills, but your, your confidence, your belief in yourself, the, the amount of value that you believe that you hold after brain injury is often shattered. You could have the skills, but the confidence might not be there. Meet people where they're at and then align tasks with an individual's preferences that's why I talked earlier about making that, carving out that um, non-contingent quality time where you really get to focus on relationship building and, and hearing someone's story and <clears throat> what's motivating to you and what are your preferences? What are your dislikes? What's reinforcing? Aligning tasks with an individual's preferences as well as their abilities. The next frontal lobe impact section is memory. <clears throat> Again, and a lot of these, this first one here probably is, you know, you're like, well, yeah, I know. Again, a small but really mighty tool that can make a huge difference and can set the tone. Greet and reconnect using your name and relationship to the survivor at the onset of every exchange, especially if you're a professional. So for example, whether that's over the phone or in person, <clears throat> good morning, Tom, this is Mary Smith, your social worker. Don't assume that he or she remembers your name, even if you've had numerous occasions where you've interacted before. Just proactively and um, compassionately remove that barrier to prevent them feeling embarrassed and having to ask what it is. Because that's really hard. You've got this person's been on my team for a year. And she's helped me a gajillion times. <clears throat> and I can't even remember her first freaking name. Like that would be really hard. Help them by just introducing yourself at the onset of every exchange. There's no guilt. There's no shame. And then if necessary, regularly, regularly review orientation tools. <clears throat> 
So in a residential setting, it could be <coughs> printed and laminated visuals posted on a wall in someone's room <clears throat> that say something as simple as my name is John Smith. I live at the name of the group home. I live here because I have a brain injury from falling at work. I am married to Susan to create environmental anchors if memory is an issue. Just, you know, get creative, just getting creative and meeting people where they're at and then creating those tools necessary to navigate through their day with a brain injury. Be patient and compassionate if a story is repeated. For example, oh yeah, this sounds familiar. You may have mentioned it to me, but keep going versus you're repeating yourself again. I've heard this before. Again, saying the same thing in a different way. There's such power in that. Check for understanding to ensure that he or she understands what's being said or asked. For example, if you're um, attending a doctor's appointment with a survivor, or you are um, in a big, a big virtual meeting with other providers and, and, uh, and a uh, survivor saying, gosh, that was a lot of information. Can we just push pause for a second? What's your understanding of what the doctor just said? Some of your main points, keywords, the most important details. If possible, at the onset of an interaction, offer or the, the you know, or the conclusion of, offer to provide a summary of your conversation via a note, a text, an email. I'll often do this with my neural resource facilitation clients because <clears throat> I'll, you know, might share a lot of information over the phone. And I tell them, hey, I don't want you to have anxiety right now about trying to absorb everything we're talking about. I'm going to shoot you an email when we're done and I'll send you all the main points so you can just, you know, lean into this conversation and relax. I'll send you all the information you need to know. This can help to decrease anxiety during a conversation, lowering the pressure to remembering everything. And then the person can, can just drop their shoulders and just be more present. Establish a predictable home base for regularly used important items. I do this for myself, <clears throat> my husband and my kids. <clears throat> Again, these are just good practice, honestly. So for example, designate a basket near the front door where your keys, your wallet, your sunglasses, your phone, your med planner live. Label cupboards and drawers if you need to with pictures and or text of what can be found inside. Utilize visual low-tech assistive devices like calendars, planners, to-do lists, grocery lists, meal planning menus, post-its and incorporate the use of alarms and reminders via phones, tablets, computers, alarm clocks, med planners sometimes have them, and then even more higher tech devices like electronic personal assistants like the Alexa Echo Dot, for example. Um, create concrete, tangible ways of noting things that have happened that can be referred to later. Um, I worked with an individual who <laughs> would overeat because he would forget after eating that he ate it all. So a whiteboard posted on the refrigerator <clears throat> that notes what he or she has eaten all day and they had to drink. A call log placed near a phone to record the details of outgoing calls to prevent um, perseverative repeated calls to the same person or agency within a short amount of time. Or even a daily journal in which the events of the day can be recorded. If a person's not able to write, it can be something that a staff or um, you know, a, a caregiver writes down that can be referred to later. Again, just meeting people where they're at. And then because neurobehavioral challenges are common after a frontal lobe injury, providing behavioral feedback is inevitable, right? And being able to do it well is crucial. Praise should not always be contingent on results. There's nothing worse than trying your best and not being recognized and praised for your effort. Feed, and we're going back to something I talked about earlier, feed or reinforce the behavior you want to see more of using behavior specific praise. So for example, good job calming down, which is nice. I mean, that works, right? But how does this sound? Hey, I love the way you stopped yourself there and took some deep breaths to calm down. I'm really proud of you. I know how hard that is. I struggle with that too sometimes. State behavioral expectations using positive language versus negative. And a lot of these, you guys, 
I do too. That's why it's good to have a reminder is stuff that we just, we do without thinking about it. And we do it with the best of intentions until we kind of stop and sort of um, reflect on um, our approach. So avoid using words like no, stop, and don't. So for example, instead of saying stop spitting, swallow your spit, please. Or don't whine versus take a deep breath and let's try that again. Again, I, I sound like a broken record, but saying the same thing differently. And, and one of those is in a way that's going to be so much better received. Suggest a functionally equivalent, or in other words, that means similar in reason or what it provides. So suggest a functionally equivalent, appropriate alternative for undesirable behaviors. You can't target a behavior for decrease without putting something in its place. So for example, <clears throat> somebody who's chewing on an eraser, pencil eraser, because they need some sensory um, oral input, instead of just saying, quit chewing on your pencil eraser, that's disgusting. Hey, here's some gum to chew on. That's much safer than that eraser. What flavor do you want? I have cherry or grape. As we talked about early, earlier on, disinhibition can be a struggle for survivors of brain injury. Impulsivity is behaving in the now, remember, without thinking about the potential future consequences of one's behavior. So when possible, help be their frontal lobe, their healthy frontal lobe. Clearly connect his or her behavior, <coughs> excuse me, with the concrete natural consequences that are possible. Because again, they might not be able to do that on their own. So for example, here's that contingency. If you continue to blank, then blank. If you continue to raise your voice at me like that over the phone, then I'm gonna have to end this call and we'll talk again some other time. Clearly communicating an if then contingency can support him or her with that risk assessment. Being able to genuinely and effectively communicate empathy is a key tool in interacting with humans in general, but especially those with a history of trauma like brain injury. And empathy is vital in navigating challenging neurobehavioral issues related to frontal lobe injury. You can see and validate someone's feelings without giving attention to <coughs> and validating actions that are not appropriate. So for example, it's not okay to yell at me. I can see in here that you are upset. You are feeling rushed, which I know is something you don't like. How can I help you get ready for your doctor's appointment? Remember that empathy isn't about feeling for or fixing someone's situation. Empathy is about holding space with another. You're meeting them where they're at, fully present, feeling with someone and letting them know that they're not alone. Check for understanding using gentle, reflective listening to ensure that you've um, understood what they've said. So for example, what I'm hearing you say is like mirror back in your own words, your understanding of how he or she feels and why. If you are incorrect, you can say, hey, I'm sorry, help me see what you see here. Approaching checking for understanding in this kind of tentative way communicates that you acknowledge that he or she is the expert on his or her own emotions. You're not saying their emotions are wrong. Help me see what you see so I can understand. You do not have to agree with how they feel. You just have to be willing to see it. Normalize feelings. For example, the grief that you're experiencing is called ambiguous loss. This is a very common response to the deep loss you've experienced since your brain injury. You're not alone in how you feel. <coughs> Validate feelings. For example, I know you're disappointed because we had to reschedule your community outing today. I hear you. I get it. It was not my intention to upset you. I'm really sorry that I had to change things on you. I know you really enjoy getting out. Empathize and hold space for feelings. For example, I'm so sorry that you're going through this. It means a lot to me that you feel safe enough with me to talk about how you're feeling. I just want you to know that I'm always here to listen, even if I don't have a solution. And then even with the best of intentions, avoid saying I understand. As unless your life has been personally impacted in a very real, very personal way, by brain injury, you don't understand. And that can be a really triggering thing to hear. Moreover, if you've met one person with brain injury 
we always say you've met one person with brain injury, right? No two journeys are the same. Avoid saying at least you can still blank. No one wants to live an at least life. When you at least all over someone, you inadvertently make them feel invalidated, unheard, alone, compared, minimized. <clears throat> Avoid saying, be thankful you survived. And this is almost always said with, at least I would like to believe compassion. You know, you're trying to relate to and navigate the pain someone's feeling. Be thankful you survived. I am. But keep in mind that there is a deep, profound grief associated with having sustained a brain injury, making it very, very difficult to be thankful for surviving despite all that one has lost. Many survivors initially, <clears throat> and not even initially, intermittently throughout their, their journey post brain injury, wish that they hadn't survived. Avoid the use of toxic positivity. So for example, it's okay and completely understandable that you are feeling negative right now. Feel what you need to feel versus just be positive. Empathy is not about insisting that everything is and will be okay. <clears throat> Rather, acknowledging that it is not and how that feels to him or her. Some of the most <coughs> impactful conversations I've had around empathy with a survivor is being incredibly raw. Like this, this freaking sucks. And it's not fair. You're right. Brain injury shouldn't be a thing that, that happens to people and it shouldn't be a thing that happened to you. It's not fair and it's not okay. I hear you. Just being raw and real and communicating. I, I, I hear you. I, I see you. Because neurobehavioral challenges and subsequent interpersonal conflict is common after a frontal lobe injury, having the skills necessary to navigate conflict resolution and de-escalation is vital. Have a conversation about and observe what their triggers are so as to proactively avoid them as much as you can in the future, as well as to learn how to manage their response when they're triggered. For example, I want to learn how to support you better during tough situations. What are the things that make you anxious? What are the things that piss you off? What makes your heart hurt? Assist him or her with something that's called body mapping in an effort to identify how their body feels and looks when anxious, frustrated, so on. The purpose of body mapping is to gain access to one's own body through self-observation and self-inquiry. This can help an individual and the people around him or her be as pro proactive as possible about intervening at the onset of symptoms with helpful calming strategies. For example, when somebody gets mad, <clears throat> when I, whenever I, I write a behavior support plan, I like to include a section on signs of early agitation and then signs of escalation so that the people working with that person, including that person themselves, can see, okay, so when John shuts down, he's normally a really gregarious, uh, social, funny guy. And when he starts to get quiet, his, you know, his ears turn red, he starts drumming his fingers, starts pacing, he might ball his fists a little. Okay, those, that's, those, are the early, those are the early signs that something's going on. When you know that, then you can go, okay, I see it. Hey, hey John, <clears throat> can, I check, can I check in with you about something? I'm seeing that you're doing you know, X, Y, Z. And I, know, and I know because I've worked with you for so long, but this generally means you're feeling blank. Am I right? And if I am, how, what can we do? Can we look at the, your, your menu of coping skills? What can we do right now that's going to help you calm down? I want to see you be successful. What can we do? It's a very, very helpful thing to walk through this with people. And, and not just the survivor, but the people working around the survivor, because managing neurobehavioral challenges is difficult. You need to know your own, you need to know what your own buttons are because they will get pushed purposely or in, or, or, you know, unconsciously they're, I mean, they're going to get pushed. Um, and then you need to know when you are at a low level of agitation, okay, I need to step away and tap out before I say or do something that I shouldn't create a visual menu of his or her coping skills in a style that is preferred and most effective, you know, in a dignified way could be posted on the wall of a bedroom, 
maybe even a notes app on a phone or on a post-it and a wallet, something that somebody can refer to in a tangible way. And then and another important thing here is to practice using these coping skills in situations when he or she is calm. <clears throat> you don't want to do all of your teaching of, of new skills in, in situations where somebody is escalated or upset. So you might do, you know, role play sessions throughout the day. Okay, let, let's sit down um, and, you know, we're going to take five, 10 minutes here and just run through some, some scenarios together about when and how to use your coping skills. Okay, so I'm going to be blank, you know, that kind of thing. You're going to role play, role play. So then when you find yourself in those real situations, they've practiced. Respond versus react. Don't accept the invitation to argue. I use this uh, metaphor a lot, um, not metaphor, I guess visual is how I picture it in my head when I've been triggered by <laughs> a client, um, it could be a friend or family member where I'm literally imagining in my mind's eye, them standing in front of me, kind of waving an invitation to argue with me. And, and you know, it's like, you know, don't take the bait. This is going to be, it's just power and control. We're going to find ourselves in this endless frustration, frustrating loop of, you know, battling one another. Pick those battles carefully. Don't accept the invitation to argue. Do you want to be right? Or do you want to be happy? I like that one too. And then apologize and repair it. If, is, if it is perceived that you interrupted someone, were distracted, misunderstood. If someone tells you that you hurt them, you don't get to decide that you didn't. I think that's so important for us to remember in interacting with each other as humans. How you feel is how you feel. It's not right or wrong. And if you hurt someone, if they, they feel hurt, you don't get to decide that you didn't hurt them. And what that might look like, and I, I worked with a gentleman in a, a CNRS <coughs> setting, a 24-hour residential setting for individuals with severe neurobehavioral challenges, who was very upset at the, at the time, lots of verbal aggression, was certain that I had interrupted him and uh, I offended him. I made him really mad. And I, I didn't, but again, I, that was his perception and his, how he felt is how he felt. So I said, you know, my apologies. I didn't realize that I made you feel interrupted. And that was absolutely not my intention. I would not have done that on purpose. I'm really sorry. You have my attention now. Why don't you go ahead and tell me that again? Avoid saying calm down or relax, as we all know that those statements are commonly triggering. <laughs> Instead, check in and offer support. So for example, are you okay? I felt your energy shift. Did I do something to upset you? Or please correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like you might be upset about something. You've gotten really quiet and you're pacing. Is there anything I can do to help? Don't try to reason with him or her while upset as your message won't be heard. And we've all experienced that and been on the receiving end of being upset and someone's talking at us and we are not hearing anything they're saying. So instead in those moments, shift your focus to offering help and suggesting specific ways that you might be able to support him or her in calming down. So I can see that you're really stressed out right now. Should we go look at your menu of coping skills? <coughs> I know that deep breathing is on there. Can I coach you through some deep breathing? We can do that together. Or maybe we can just go even take a five minute walk. I like to help you if I can. And then avoid using the word why when processing behavior, if you're able to. So for example, why is your room always such a mess versus cleaning your room gets really overwhelming, doesn't it? Knowing where to start and sorting all this. A lot of your room or a lot of things in your room are out of place. Why don't we organize this together? You pick up the socks and I'll pick up the shirts. How does that sound? So I could go on and on and on and on because I, well, first of all, being a behavior analyst, I love behavior management. I love working in the field of brain injury. It's so rewarding. And I love to teach and talk about hope. Um, more specifically, ways of cultivating hope by supporting individuals and the people around them, friends, family, caregivers, and professionals on their care teams with the tools that they need 
and that they deserve to be successful in managing the impact of brain injury. Reminding survivors that they can live well with a brain injury. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it very much. Thank you.